The first speaker of today is uh, Florian Lipsmeyer. Uh, he studied uh, bioinformatics and biomathematics in Bielefeld University and joined uh, Roche afterwards as a senior scientist, becoming a principal data scientist in 2016. And now since August 2018, he is the digital biomarker data analysis lead of PRED Informatics of Roche in Basel, Switzerland. So he's located in the same city as our department. Really happy to have you here, Florian. Thank you very much for, for coming. And Florian is going to talk about the various roles of machine learning in the development and use of novel digital health technologies. So with that, Florian, the floor is yours. The roles of machine learning around novel digital health technologies or digital biomarkers. Um, I want to quickly introduce what I mean with that and, and also why we think um, digital health technologies, digital biomarkers um, will play or are already starting to play an important role um, around disease assessment, especially in a clinical study, clinical trial context, but also beyond. Um, for that, I would like all of you to just think about your daily life and, and try to start, remember how you are feeling, how you are felt last week, a few days before, a few days less. Um, and now imagine you are someone who has a disease in general. So, and what you can already get from that is that there are differences. And, and that is what all our measurements are about. So basically you are living as I'm living 365 days a year. And depending on your disease, <clears throat> you might have good days and bad days and moderate days with your disease. Meaning your disease is fluctuating every day in one way or the other. Plus, depending on what the disease you are having, your disease might progress over time. And in our daily life, or especially in a clinical study context, what is happening is, of course, you are going to a clinician, to a physician, to get assessed, to see how is your disease developing. Are you getting more healthy? Are you getting more ill? And at this visit in a clinic or at a physician, you can do different types of assessments to get more information about the disease. That could be just simple blood measurements or MRIs or other things. But often, especially in neurological diseases, what you will do is certain types of assessments where um, different types of disease symptoms will be assessed by you performing cognition tests or different types of motor tests. And the physician is observing you in order to see how good are you doing these things? And then these type of motor tests are then rated on a severity scale, often between zero and four, for example, or vice versa, you are asked, what type of problems do you have in daily life? How difficult is it for you to do your daily housework or just drinking or going around or meeting with friends? And also again, on a scale of zero to four, for example, and then these type of problems are just summed up to a total score. And that is then um, a proxy for your total disease severity. And as you can see from, from this picture, what you get there are actually only spot checks because the disease is variable and it's a chance event when you visit the clinician, whether you have good, moderate, or weak symptom day, obviously. Plus, if you are asked, uh, like you maybe just also so for yourself, it's really difficult to remember beyond a certain time horizon how good you were actually feeling. So there's a recall record period, which again means everything you can tell at, a, uh, at your physician is just a, another spot check of how you really feel over a longer course of, in time. What that means in a clinical study context is that um, it's, it adds 
inherent variability to all these measures that you get there. And in a clinical study context, what you don't want to have is variability in, um, in or, yeah, person, per, inter person variability in how you assess disease. Because that just means you need more patients or longer time horizons to actually see in a study whether a drug is working or not. Because you might have an arm where patients are not getting a drug and another arm where patients are getting the drug. And then over time, you try to observe whether one arm is doing differently than the other. And if you have this inherent variability and that is too big, you need to decrease it by increasing sample size or time. And that brings us to digital health technologies or digital biomarkers of their mission in, in, in that. How can they augment what is currently done in, in the clinical study context? So maybe, first of all, what do we consider as digital biomarkers. And this is just an example in that sense, but we consider digital biomarkers basically readouts from digital devices, often even consumer grade devices, like it is depicted here, uh, a smartphone, for example, or a smartwatch, but can also be more dedicated devices like um, sleep mats measure, measuring sleep or something else. What all of these have in common is that they have digital sensors that produce continuous data streams. So you might, not, you might know or might not know that, but your smartphone is continuously producing gyroscope and acceleration data. That helps, for example, to see whether you have turned your phone and go into portrait or landscape mode for your photos or for playing some games. So that is the type of data you see here in the small visualization on the lower left where I'm just walking down a corridor and this type of data is recorded. And what you can then get from this type of data and you're getting that in your usual smartphone, for example, are your daily steps in life or your distance walk. But you can get also a lot of more data from that. And that is what will be the focus about in this whole talk and why ML and AI are actually um, a method space which is I would say necessary to really unlock this type of data. So just to recapitulate why we currently have a challenge and why digital health technologies could for a solution there. First of all, frequency. As I said, we have this fluctuation of symptoms and you just cannot go every day to a clinic or to, to your physician to get assessed. That's just impossible. And there's the precision problem. Um, you, you might have these low resolution scales. So I said, if you rate something on a scale of zero to four, then that is inherently low resolution. Then there's uh, the question of accuracy. So you have a, some subjectivity in there. You as a person, as a patient might have a very, very different view on your disease compared to another patient, or also a physician might have slight biases in how to rate certain things. And also he has good and bad days. And there's this reliability component where different people, as I said, also consistently rate disease symptoms in a different way. And so you might have these type of biases in there. Plus, if you go to a physician or into a hospital, you might notice that yourself, you are inherently also often influenced by that. So you are not your daily self in your home environment. So this is also about what we call ecological validity. So really how does what you measure there in the clinic really reflect your performance in daily life, which is in the end what we care all about. With different types of digital solutions, you can actually try to overcome that by increasing the frequency, by measuring basically, basically daily or continuously. You can get a greater precision because you have these continuous data streams which you can turn into continuous output. Also with these continuous data streams, you have the possibility to get to better or greater accuracy. And, and by employing these consistently, you, and using the same algorithms, obviously, you should get better reliability. Plus, by measuring at home, you also get better ecological validity. So 
that brings us to what do we do about these type of things and how are, is this field actually developing and I think it's, it's really best um, shown by, by how we have developed since six years or seven years. Um, we started with, with um, a first proof of concept smartphone application where, um, where, where we tested in a um, phase 1B study some simple measurements on a smartphone, which we deployed in a clinical study to the Parkinson's disease patients, and we asked them to do certain tests. Um, that worked very well. And from there on, we started to develop more of these type of solutions in different diseases. And um, since then, we have now collected data over the time from more than 5,000 subjects um, at, at a lot of different sites in a lot of different countries. And, and all of the data as of, I don't know, half a year ago, for example, is already adding up to more than 500 terabytes of collected data. And that does not even include a special type of study we are also running, which is a bring your own device study, which is called Floodlight Open, where we have a few other thousand patients all around or participants all around the world who just have downloaded that app and, and um, are collecting data for themselves or in other types of study setups that have nothing to do with what we are doing. So you see, this is really a way to collect additional data and it is a lot of data and you need to make sense of this type of data. So maybe just to illustrate that in, in different types of settings, what we have, for example, um, currently deployed is in different types of um, solutions in with smartphones, smart watches, um, but also with beacons and 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 sleep mats. But so that's ballistography um, in Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, or in autism spectrum disorder, where we ask patients to do certain tests, but also where we passively monitor certain things in their daily life. Like, I mean, they carry around the smartwatch or the smartphone in daily life and we collect sensor data and then look, look into their gait patterns, arm swing patterns, their mobility or their sleep, for example. And um, with this type of data, we really hope to go into the details of what can be measured about the disease. And I will give some of these examples in the next slide. So just as illustration before we really go into the machine learning part. The one example is for example, is, is the hand turning test. So what we ask patients to do there is every second day, please turn your hand as fast as possible a few times. And then you get something like this, where the smartphone is turning then heavily and you see, depending on how diseased you might are. Um, so in Parkinson's disease, for example, you have something which is called bradykinesia, which is making you slower and doing less amplitude movements, or also leading to hesitation in these movements. And all of that you see here in subject B, where you have lower amplitude, less fast movements, and you also see first signs of hesitation. So this is something very obvious. Um, on the next example, you see something which is then um, bring you, why is it open, uh, or important to measure often at home? What you see here is on the lower axis, you see um, the assessment of something similar in the clinic. And um, what you see there is there are a lot of patients that are rated by the physician at that spot check in the clinic as having no problems with hand movement. On the left, on the y-axis, you see what we measure as maximal hand turning speed in daily life. And what you see then also is that there's generally a nice kind of correlation, but you also see outliers here that are clearly behaving differently compared to what the physician has seen. So if this subject is more in this type of disease group than in the healthy disease group. And if you look into that with, with such a video, then you see that um, 
subject B actually is showing maybe not too much less speed. Yes, a little bit of less speed, but also less amplitude, but not showing the hesitation that you see in subject C, for example. And um, meaning this patient is really behaving differently in daily life. And if you measure that often and confirm this type of finding, then you can be pretty sure that you're seeing a different type of disease picture than what the physician is seeing. This is what I meant with inherent variability and ecological validity at the home site. We have another test. Here's another example where we just ask the patient to hold the smartphone still in the hand. And this is a Huntington's disease um, patients which have involuntary movements, which is called chorea. And then what you can see there is um, something like this happening. So a healthy control has relatively low movement, but um, Huntington's disease patients can have quite a lot of movement. And also starting with very subtle movements. That's where um, also this, this higher sensitivity is coming in, which you as a physician might have problems actually to see. And what we could show there then, for example, is um, that again, there's a lot of variability, but generally this test is really well, well suited to assess the same type of symptom as assessed by a physician. And we could show that just with one single feature already. We see quite a nice correlation and uh, quite nice similar results in different studies where we have de deployed this type of device. Still, this is all single feature. So for the context of this presentation, still maybe a little bit less relevant and poor. Just as a last point to convince you why this can be important. Um, this is a last example from, again, a single feature from a U-turn test where we ask the patient at home to do a few U-turns um, and we measure the speed in this example. And this is from a multiple sclerosis patient in a study. Um, and multiple sclerosis is a disease where you can have um, relapse events, meaning that um, you might have, you can call it certain spikes of disease um, where you suddenly get worse and then you can also get better afterwards to a certain extent. And what you see here is basically this daily measurement. And you see that for half of, of, of the observation period, he's doing kind of fine for, for his kind of performance. But then you also see that suddenly something is changing. And in this study, we luckily asked these patients also, OK, please report when you feel that you have a relapse event. And what you see here is really when they start to report that, we also see a clear distinct pattern in, in this type of test. And you can, of course, imagine that um, with more data, you can home in, into that much, much more precise and do that automatically, and maybe do that even earlier than it is already happening. So it's really performing worse. Last but not least, and that, that is then um, important to keep in mind um, for the rest of the talk, what do we want to do with these type of measurements? We want to develop new outcomes, new scores that can be used in different ways to assess drug efficacy, for example, or disease progression, or maybe also in other contexts, distinguish different types of disease populations for stratification purposes. And there are basically two different ways to do that. One is a completely data-driven way, which will resonate very well with you as an audience, I guess. And that is a, a way where you use the data and try to be maximally sensitive in different ways, types of ways to really be able to measure disease and disease progression very, very early on. There's also another way, which we will not focus in this presentation a lot about, and that's the patient-driven way. So rather than selecting features from the data or um, doing a lot of crazy AI stuff, you, you go to the patient, ask the patient, okay, what is really relevant for you in terms of daily life? What is really a problem for you? And then you develop measures from the sensor data to measure that. And then you obviously also try to maximize that and get a more patient-centric view and score on that. These are not the same thing because not everything you are able to measure 
might be directly relevant to a patient in daily life. You might not care about this problem or might not realize it, but you might be able to measure with that something very sensitive just to keep the distance. All right, so let's turn into how can digital biomarkers be influenced by machine learning and AI components. For me, this is really about optimizing on the information extraction but also keeping explainability of what we get there. So these are two inherent components that need to go together for digital health technology or digital biomarkers, because what we are developing there is really for, for clinical studies, for patients, for regulators, for physicians, and all of them really want to understand what you are measuring there. So this is an important component to keep in mind. And um, that also kind of influences how you need to design ML AI components in different stages of the development of digital biomarkers. So what do I mean with optimize on information extraction while keeping sustainability? I try to visualize that in a, in a simple plot. So you have to imagine, as I already mentioned, we are collecting a lot of sensor data, can be acceleration data, touchscreen data, microphone, audio data, can be anything, GPS, Bluetooth, but what we want to have from this data, and that is something we also owe our, our study participants who collect this data for us, that we get the maximum disease information from this raw sensor data. So we need some type of function which gives us that type of maximal disease information. And what that actually usually means in one way or the other is that you need to care about the quality and the context of this data. You need to have signal processing that gives you different types of readouts from this data that are meaningful. You need to aggregate them in some type of way to get this type of maximal disease information. And vice versa, often it might also be really good to be able to go from this maximal disease information to the raw sensor data and understand where is that actually coming from. These are continuous data streams. And hence, it is not always straightforward to understand, OK, what is it that makes the signal which we compute here so unique? Which type of features are the ones playing a role? Where are these features predominantly coming from in the sensor stream? And that is something which is also very important and we shouldn't forget about. And it's a question, of course, always, how can this be done? And even worse, what is maximal disease information? How can we actually approximate that we have reached this goal of getting to maximal disease information? All of that I will try to highlight in the next yeah, half hour um, to really convince you that using MLI components in this digital biomarker of context is something necessary to reach this, but also that um, AI is actually something that could, from my perspective, help us to approximate what maximal disease information actually is. So sometimes digital biomarkers can be a puzzle. And that's also why I depicted it, or the different ways how we currently use MLAI as, as kind of different puzzle components in this quest for the best digital readout in a given disease. And what I will show in the next slides are examples from all of these areas where we, do, where we use it. This is about data quality, data contextualization. It is what you all care mostly, most probably about. It's about feature-free deep learning to classify some things. But it's also about using features directly for developing or for predicting clinical scores or doing classification. It is also about using AI components to develop something which I term meta raw data. You will see what I mean with that later. And it is also about going back from the classification or the prediction result to the raw data. So let us first start with what I mean with data quality checks. As you always know, with data, it's garbage in, garbage out. So you should care about what you are collecting there and what it actually means. And um, what that also means is if you do something like we are doing, 
and that is deploying measurement solutions to patients in their home setting. You collect a lot of data, but you collect it in a remote, unsupervised setting. So you actually don't really know if someone is using what you give to them in the best and correct possible way. And even if they are doing it, you might still get data that is sometimes just not usable for you. And what that means is to start with everything, you need to care about data quality. And that can be raw data quality. Not every device is the same, not every device, there might be faulty devices. So you need to care about sampling frequency and deviations from that, generally the noise and the bias of, of, of sensors. You need to care about external impact. So the way you behave might impact on what you can measure or not. Um, some of you might notice that, um, that if you count, if you look into your step count, it's not always counting steps because in some instances, you might do something different, but the algorithm still counts what you're doing there as steps. You might go on a trampoline and then in uh, doing some sports or doing something else. That's all still something where the algorithm might not realize you're not walking, but still it might count steps. And so this can be also about sensor placement. And for example, very simply, also just the correct execution of a daily test that you might ask the patient or the participants to do. So that here's a very, very simple example where we ask patients to do a simple digit matching on a test on, 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 on a smartphone screen. And um, with that, we um, want to access their information processing speed. So patients see symbols on a screen and they have a mapping of symbols to digits and then they need to um, press the right type of button on the screen, right, right type of number as fast as possible. And that do a lot of times until um, the test runs out. And what can happen in these type of instances is of course that a uh, participant is just not interacting with the screen or he is not really doing it in the way he's supposed to do it. He's just playing to quit to go through this game for the game day. Um, so you need quality flex for that to, for example, see if there's no screen interaction during the time or whether he's just clicking through, meaning you have really low response times and really, <laughs> really low accuracy, which points to the fact that they're just not doing the test suite to instruction. That's a very ex simple example, but um that's something yeah we are doing let's turn to a much more involved example and that is something which some of you might actually know or realize um who are doing who are using modern smartphones equipped with uh ppg sensor so these that are the these green lights you have at the back of your smartphone in in case um you are using that and so these ppg signals are basically trying to measure um, heart rate and other things um, from how there are changes in, in the reflection from your, from, from your veins in, in, um, at, at the hand, basically. And um, what we are interested in in different types of disease contexts is, is to measure what is called heart rate variability, because heart rate variability can tell you something about stress and anxiety state of the person at a given point in time. But, and that is something you might realize if you use these devices, this signal is heavily influenced by what you are doing. Meaning if you are doing anything where you use your hands in different types of movement, these measurements might either not be possible or get really, really wrong. And, um, and then what you need there is a quality assessment of how does your signal need to look like so that you can trust in the end, the HRV readout. And what we try to develop here or what we developed here is what we call a kind of quality metric using a machine learning type of approach to assess from the raw data whether a later readout of HRV is trustworthy or not. And we did it in a way that we collected gold standard data, ECG data, so that's this red type of signal, what you see here. Um, and you see nice, what is called RRI signals. So these are the intervals between successive heartbeats. That's the one thing. 
And from that, you can then very reliably calculate HRV metrics, so hard, different types of metrics that approximate heart rate variability. And on the other hand, in parallel, we collected this type of PPG data and also turned that into different heart rate variability readouts. And then we really compared or calculated a, a difference between what we get at heart rate variability from the PPG and this ECG. And we assume that the ECG signal is always correct. And then we extracted a lot of different types of features from this, from this PPG signal and used that in a linear model with LASU to develop a, a scoring metric. So just to show you um, what that means as, as an example, we, for example, let the patients or the participants doing paced breathing. And you see that there are then variations in, in how the signal is changing there for ECG and PPG. And you see for this example, the signal is very, very similar. That's nice. And it's also explainable because when you do paced breathing, you usually don't do it, use your hands. But if you do typing on a smartwatch or, or on, a, on a keyboard, smartphone, or just walk around, that already changes the picture a lot. So what we then looked into is really what is what is the type of model that reduces um, the estimation error between what is measured by the um, PPG and by the EEG type of signals? And what type of window length do you need to get a minimal difference between these type, two types of signals? And, and that, was then, that is in the end then the machine learning model that we are then deploying where on, on data that we are continuously collecting from patients and then get a continuous readout of what is high and low quality data and where can we then actually use our dedicated HRV algorithms to collect and or to, to calculate this readout and later use it in statistical analysis on what is changing for these patients over time, when do they have anxiety, how often is that happening and how do potentially drugs influence these type of um, states. So that, is a, that was an example around quality, and I hope you understand why quality is important. Another example of um, how to use AI is, as I said, um, what I take term, because I didn't find a better term for that, um, meta raw data. Um, so in different instances, you, you collect raw data, but this raw data might not be directly suitable to what you want to measure. And that, and, and I make there a distinction between you do a little bit of filtering to denoise the data, or you turn your raw data into something else, which is still a type of raw data, but <clears throat> nearer to what you want to actually measure, and, and then calculate features from that. And examples for that is, for example, sensor fusion, where you use, where you get the IMU data, acceleration, gyroscope, magnetometer. And you fuse that with an algorithm and get from that, for example, velocity or displacement instead. Or another very simple example is you, you, you speak and then you turn what you yeah, say, what, what an audio signal actually into text. And then you deploy algorithms on this text data rather than on the audio file. Very different types of assessment. Um, or another example, which I guess we'll, we'll show you in a moment, is you'd collect video data and um, turn that into movement coordinates and calculate from there certain types of um, assessment. And that is actually something which is also tried with um, smartphones or also um, other smart devices, um, and which we had also or what, that we also investigated in the past. So. There, there is um, there's an open source yeah, open source library available um, where where researchers have developed a, a deep learning application that is trying to infer where you are looking on a smartphone when you have the the camera running. So they are taking um, pictures or they are. Um, having video stream data 
from, from your left and right eye, from your whole face, but also a face grid, and put these into a deep learning application and have then collected a lot of crowdsourced um, data with different types of tests where you had bad dots on different parts of the screen and then followed that and, and developed a solution that is supposed to predict where you're looking on the screen. And for us, this is a, a potentially interesting application, of course, because depending on what disease you are looking into, um, that might be actually important because there are certain diseases like autism spectrum disorder um, who have inherently um, a different way to, to assess, for example, faces. So you might look more, so we as uh, maybe um, people who don't uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not um, um, in, in the autism spectrum disorder, usually have a tendency to look more to the eyes, whereas certain subpopulations in ASD might have a tendency to look more to the mouth, for example. And that is something you could accept uh, and, and, and measure. And, and we wanted to see if that's possible with such a solution. So what we looked then really into is, um, um, how that works on a smartphone and um, let uh, participants do different types of tests following dots and uh, looking into um, to eyes and mouth and different types of patterns. And, and then we looked into um, how good is the direct output of this uh, deep learning solution and are there different ways to optimize on that for example, by having a calibration task at the um, at the beginning and then doing some linear transformations or using support vector machine approaches to optimize on the classification error. And we also looked into different instances of um, lightning and so on to see how robust that is. And you see some of the results here, the rest you can see in the publication and you see that um, obviously um, there are ways to improve on these type of results and this is from my point of view, really something where more research can and should be invested um, to, to get better eye tracking for such smart solutions. Next thing is um, what I call data contextualization. So that brings us back to, so what does context really mean? Um, context is for me really the circumstances of or the setting where we collected segments of raw sensor data. So, and why is that necessary? Because we need to understand where we collected the data. Otherwise, we cannot know what is the right algorithm to actually apply it, or is the data trustworthy? So what we, we need is we need to annotate somehow this data with contextual information. But how is that possible if the data is collected in a remote setting all the time? That means on the one hand, we need to get that information to directly compute, compute features with this information or to identify interesting data segments to then choose the right algorithm on that. And examples of that is what I call passive monitoring. So where you just continuously bear your smart device and we collect raw sender data. And then you might want to know what type of activities have you already done? Have you been walking, sitting? Where have you done that? At home or outside? Did you have something like this shaking type of event of Korea or something in Parkinson's disease, which is called tremor, which is a kind of continuous, regular handshaking in a different type of way, uh, which really impacts your daily life. Um, but you need to identify these type of events in your in your raw sensor data. Otherwise, you cannot use um, the type of right type of algorithms to actually then calculate anything on that. Other examples are, for example, audio, where you might want to identify different speakers or you want to classify different types of ambient noise to see whether the, if the audio data you are getting there is usable or um, what part is actually usable or um, also where are you actually, is, is, is there, something about um, also your social daily life that you can get out of that. Are you, are you in a context of a, a lot of people, a lot of 
things happening or are you always in quiet status? Let me give you some examples why AI is really something you need to use there. One first example is you really from what we have in autism spectrum disorder as a conversation test where we ask the caregiver and the patient to have a daily conversation and um, where we want to see how is this conversation go, going really. Is there um, something we can learn from that? Um, for example, there's the hypothesis that, that, that there are differences in how are turns taken, that, that um, there might be interruptions or that, that, um, that um, yeah, different types of how monologues are done or, or something similar. And what you need to do for that is in the first place, you need to diarize the speakers. So who is talking when? And you need to do that from the raw sensor data. There are different ways to do that. One possible way is to turn the raw sensor data into something which is called a mass spectrogram, and then you can deploy different types of deep learning solutions, for example, to um, then try to separate um, speakers. And, and that's something we did in this context, and um, then looked into what does that tell us about the disease. And what you can see from there is in the first place um, that we are getting first good correlation um, between what is the actual true classification there and, and what we predict in terms of patient response duration in terms of um, proportion of how much the participants are speaking. So that's already great. And um, what you can also learn from that is um, that this response duration, also the proportion of speech in such a conversation is really different between um, particip uh, participants from the autism, autism spectrum disorder compared to um, yeah, healthy individuals. And um, so you see that these mirrors in such a conversation test might make a lot of sense. They differentiate and, and hence with this type of solution, you can get really meaningful information, which you then in the future might um, use for tracking how this is changing over time, given certain types of therapies, either um, drugs or maybe also behavior therapies. Another important example is, and that's something which we are using across the board in many types of diseases where we collect continuous data, uh, sensor data, that is called human activity recognition. And, and for me, this is one of these examples of what I call transferring learnings from different diseases. You will later also see something which is real transfer learning in, in, in the deep learning context at the very end. So please be patient with me there. Um, but what I mean with that is, um, this is just from our first study. Um, 45 patients um, being in there um, roughly half a year. And what we collect there is uh, really um, um, 33K hours of sensor data, which is roughly 1.2 terabytes. And what we have there is the problem is this is non-labeled data from the daily life of the participants. And to really get something meaningful out of that, we need solutions for that. And what, what we deployed there is um, uh, a deep learning solution, which we trained on different openly available data sets. Um, and, and where we try to predict different types of um, activities like sitting, standing, walking, jogging, and so on. And you see a depiction here uh, in case you're interested on, on what type of deep learning solution was, was used in that instance. Um, and um, you might then ask rightly, okay, how do you actually validate something like that in a disease context? Because um, this data is not, I mean, the, the original training was done with, with data that was out there, which was not um, usually from patients, from diseased people, but from us healthy, healthy human beings. Um, but what we could actually use in this type of context is that we have walking or balance tests and other tests um, for a given disease. Um, so we actually had kind of snippets of 
of ground truth data that we could use um, to see how good this prediction model is actually working. And it's working really, really well also in this case of disease context. And then we really deployed it over this long stretches of time. And from that, we calculated, for example, the percentage of gate activity or um, how often um, these people are standing up, sitting down, um, so sit to stand or stand to sit transitions, or we identified gate segments and then tried to identify when people are turning and how fast are people turning in daily life. And what you can see here is um, that all of these measures really differentiate them in the end in daily life between age-matched healthy controls and these Parkinson's disease participants. So this is really going into the daily life and measuring something meaningful. And that's where you need really as an integral part MLAI components to get to that type of data. So why do I call this transferring learning? Because actually what we did in a second part is we did this for a smartwatch, a smartphone. And in the next set, we developed something similar for uh, a smart watch or variable. And we used that in schizophrenia study context. And what we now focus on, about on is actually not, for example, the walking activities like we did here, but we turned our view actually to the non-walking activities when people are gesturing in different types of instances, doing their housework and so on, and, and developed something which is called baby gesture count and what you can see then there is um, in, the in the schizophrenia context with participants with so-called negative symptoms, um, meaning these, these patients are maybe more apathic or, or generally, yeah, also less communicative. You see that, um, and, and that is measured by a clinical score, which is called the BNNS. Um, if you compare that to really measures from daily life, um, then you see that um, patients that are have increased BNS scores um, also show less gestures in daily life. So this is really showing that what is there um, somehow assessed in a clinical visit context is um, also reflected by patients' behavior in daily life. And, um, and, and um, yeah. And so here we will transfer to a different types of device, but a similar solution and are getting different types of meaningful information. And let's now go back to Parkinson's disease and show what that means there. Um, there, we are also interested in these type of head movements. I already mentioned um, that there's this concept of bradykinesia, the patients slow down in their hand movements. And, and this is, of course, also something that might impact their daily life. And um, going back to this type of passively monitored hand gestures, um, we can actually show that we can measure that with high test retest reliability. We see that there is a certain correlation with um, established clinical score in very early patients um, and then in a clinical study context where we actually have a drug involved, what we could show there is that um, the, the group of patients that is taking that specific drug for Parkinson's disease um, is actually slowing less of a decline of these type of hand gesture energy in this case um, compared um, to placebo patients which are not getting the drug. So here you really see that by using MLII, we get into the context of what is actually happening there. And then we measure something that might be meaningful for the patient. And then we can use that in a clinical study context to actually see what is happening in daily life and how might the drug impact changes there. That brings us to a very traditional field. And that's this taking features, a lot of features and predicting clinic scores or classifiers. And there are different reasons why to do that. First of all, you can use it to understand really what type of different information do you have in your feature space. Not everything you're measuring might be the same, but a lot of might actually be in a disease context pointing to similar things. So you need to understand the diversity of what you're measuring there in the disease context. And then of course you want to see which type of feature space is really predictive 
for a traditional clinical assessment and which part might actually give you novel information. And you can use that, for example, uh, to develop classification schemes that stratify different types of patients groups or and um, also to increase your disease understanding there of what type of problems do you measure there that are distinctive for different types of patient groups. Um, here is one example of how we do that. So what we collect is, for example, continue or uh, two minute walk test data where we ask the patients to walk um, two minutes with their smartphone and smartwatch um, in multiple sclerosis. And then um, what we want to assess there is um, how, how diseased are these patients? Um, so this is um, about the classification task where we want to really see um, is there a difference in the gait patterns between healthy volunteers, between mildly impacted MS patients and more impaired MS patients. And you can see here a depiction of how we did that. So there's a data extraction step um, where we get a lot of features from this type of raw sensor data. And then um, we develop different types of models and different types of cross-validation schemes. Very, very important is here that um, you have to keep in mind these patients are doing that every day or every few days. Um, but you really need to take care that whatever cross-validation you do, that you do a subject-wise split and um, do subject-wise predictions and don't have this cross-bleeding of information, having some samples of the subject in the training and in another set of the same subject in the prediction, because that obviously then can lead to a lot of overfitting, which was a problem in the past and some publications um, having been out there. And what you can then see from there is um, that um, with different amount of features and different combinations of the smartphone and, and, and the smartwatch and features from that, you can really increase precision and accuracy um, in, in this type of context to really differentiate um, healthy controls from mildly impacted um, micro sclerosis patients or more uh, moderately impaired patients. And I will come to back to this example at the end where we will use a deep learning solution to actually <coughs> improve on these results. Another example is the draw shape test where we ask the participant to draw certain shapes on the screen. You can see that here. And then we extract different types of features and the traditional clinical test for draw shape, uh, not for draw shape, for hand impairment, um, upper limb impairment and multiple sclerosis is called the nine hole pack test. That's something they do in the clinic where you have to, where you have a board with, with packs sticking in there. And then you take a pack pull it out, put it into a bowl, and then do that for all the packs. And then afterwards you do the reverse. And the time is measured how long that takes you for your left and right hand. And then you take a, a summary score of how long this takes. And that's um, one important upper limb breed out from my sclerosis. And um, what we did here is we used then um, our test to predict this nine hole pack test time, because as I said, I mean, we are measuring this basically daily. So we can, we wanted to see how a daily score of a, of a surrogate for nine hole pack test could then um, may be more robust and, and, and um, change over time. And you can see that, um, that, that generally we are able to predict on a cross-sectional level quite well um, these nine hole pack test times and can then use this type of classifier for these type of activities. So this is all for a single type of assessment. But of course, what might be actually really interesting is if you start combining this type of information, excuse me, <coughs> so what happens if you do different types of tests or in other instances, you might have different types of sensor data um, and then combine them and do classification or estimation of disease severity in a continuous level. And um, we also developed some 
a machine learning frameworks for that. This is here just one example. Um, um, meaning what, what we learned there is, is really um, what type of different information do we have in, in for example, a balance step compared to a dexterity test where you tap on the screen, a gate test where you walk up and down a corridor, a tremor test where you just hold the smartphone in your hand, or you do a sustained formation test where you do a continuous ah, uh, and, and then how can you combine this type of information really um, with different types of machine learning models into something that either distinguishes healthy controls for, um, from in this case, Parkinson's disease participants, or how to predict their disease severity, and one example of what you see here is where you, we use the type of rich regression type of approach um, to see um, how does um, employing different variations there um, um, lead to better or worse um, accuracy and then also sensitivity and specificity and, and what type of <clears throat> tests are there really important in that. And, and also how, much, how many days of data do we actually need to use and aggregate there to really go to get a good accuracy? And in this example, you see, for example, that collecting 10 days of data and then aggregate them in a meaningful way and put that all in the classifier really <coughs> leads to quite stable results, um, which is of course important because that might then mean that your readout is not a daily readout, but might be a 10 days aggregate readout, which you can then follow over time, which is still, of course, much better than having a clinical visit every few months or weeks. And you can see here then a prediction of a clinical assessment of that disease, which is called MDS UPDRs. And then that's what we measure there is then matching quite okay, um, given that the MDS UPDRs is also not just a motor score, but actually also measuring cognitive um, problems and other um, impairments in, in daily life, like anxiety and, and, and other problems, which of course are difficult to measure with such motor tests as I've described here. So this brings us to um, something many of you might be more interested in, and that's what I call or term feature-free deep learning to classification. Um, <clears throat> and that's one of these areas where I see tremendous potential of um, employing MLAI in different, really different types of contexts um, in the digital biomarker space. So I'm always mentioning this continuous data that we are collecting, um, but What you have to keep in mind is um, that um, our clinical studies where we collect this data are usually only with not that many participants. So you have to imagine studies between 50 to, if you're lucky, six, 700 participants. Um, and that means on the overall, that is not a lot of data to develop deep learning solutions, obviously. What we get from these patients is a lot of repeated longitudinal data. That's nice, but it is still the same patient. And um, what that means, of course, in terms of deep learning is that you are in this inherent problem of um, low sample size or low subject size. Sample is not the correct word because we have these repeated measurements, but you have these low subject size to, um, to a big need to really have enough information to build these deep learning, deep learning solutions in, in a really good unbiased way. And that is where transfer learning is something that actually can help a lot. Um, meaning what we did investigate here is, I mentioned this human activity recognition model at the very beginning. So a model which was initially designed to um, estimate different types of activities. And we developed this, this human activity recognition using publicly available data from healthy participants. And as you have seen, it, it works quite well. It can be used then also directly to generate quite important disease readouts. 
but you can rethink that of course further and coming back to the other example that I showed before um, this two minute walk test you can start thinking about okay are there ways to combine that and this is just one example obviously there are other ways um, and other other tests where you might actually do similar things so both both um, type of assessments are inherently around movement but they have different things in mind. And, and um, so what you could think first about is um, rather than developing a, a feature-based two-minute walk test classification scheme, you can use, you could develop a feature-free deep learning type of solution for that. But given that in this instance, we only had like 80 participants, 80, 90 participants, half of them multiple sclerosis patients, that's not a lot for this type of sensor data to greedy um, develop robust deep learning solutions. So what, what we have started to investigate there is um, then really a transfer, transfer learning approach where we used our previ previously trained human activity recognition model and then plugged that into another classification application around deep learning where we then wanted to use that type of pre-trained information um, to help us to actually classify better healthy controls from mildly and moderately impaired to um, healthy, uh, multiple, multiple sclerosis participants in this two minute walk test context. So you have these uh, pre trained layers which are tuned to extract a type of feature in the convolutional layers. That, um, that, that are important to distinguish different type of activities. And you can, of course, hypothesize that these type of convolutional layer based features can also be used to help in differentiating different types of walking patterns for multiple sclerosis patients. And that's what we tried out here. Um, and, and what you can see then on the lower right is is a comparison of four different types of solutions we um, did there. So first of all, as a basically ground truth type of solution, as this feature base plus a support vector machine um, solution where you see the accuracy um, and the copper and, and then also um, the MF1 score, um, which is not, I mean, which is okay, but it's, it is of course way from perfect. Then in the next steps, you see what you get if you just do directly deep learning on, on um, the two minute walk test data and you see you cannot really improve on what you got before. Might actually be worse, might actually prone to overfitting depending on what you do there. And then you see two examples where we use two different types of publicly available data to train a human activity recognition model, plug that into that um, other deep learning solution retrain it with part of the two minute walk test data and then do predictions on the rest. And um, what you see there here really is that you get a huge increase in all scores to um, see how good that solution is actually working. So you really see that in this type of instance, transfer learning is a key to unlock new information from uh, using deep learning. And this is also, so this is first of all, of course, a nice result. But for me, this is strategically also something that is bringing us nearer to what I termed at the very be beginning of what is actually the maximal information we can get out of such a two minute walk test given the sensor data we are collecting there. Because that is the inherent question. With a given feature space, are we there? Because the features, they, they are explainable. We have designed them. We, we have used our knowledge on the disease the, to develop algorithms to extract information out of the raw sensor data that we think is important in a disease context. And you see from there, if we think these features are important, we combine these features and we get okayish type of results. But if we then use this type of transfer learn deep learning solution, we get much better results really good results. And, and what we can learn from there is there's a gap in our feature space. So we are not 
currently there at the maximum information content that we could get out of this raw data, which is important because we want to get the best information possible. So this is something which I propose really as, as something to develop in the future to, to really approximate maximum information content wherever possible. And that brings me then to the last part of my talk and that's classification to raw sensor data. With this deep learning solution, there is now this development of, of new ways to unlock that black box. And one way to do that might be um, layerwise relevant propagation, um, where you take your classification results, go through the different layers back, and then pinpoint on where is actually the important signal in your raw de sensor data. And why is that important? I mentioned in the very beginning and also over the course of the talk, explainability is really key for us. So we really need to understand where is the good result coming from um, because that's what patients care about, regulators care about, doctors and other researchers are really caring about. Meaning what we want to have, I mean, we are happy with such deep learning solutions in the first place, but they need to be either explainable or even better, we can use them to pinpoint to the signals we have missed so far and then really develop dedicated um, traditional signal processing based feature algorithms and uh, to also extract that type of meaningful information and have it explainable available as readouts from this raw data. And, and that's really one of the core principles um, I think we need to get to having this type of pipeline to extract maximum information content and optimizing this pipeline by using novel and AI technology tools, which help us to go in the one direction, but also go back to in the other direction and thereby transfer learning in different types of ways over the course of this endeavor between the machine and us. So both of us need to learn and we need to use different types of um, solutions there to also transfer learnings from one disease to the other or from different related information spaces to our specific disease problem because human activity recognition for example was initially not developed for us obviously but is something which is used in different types of instances um, for sport watches or um, for just looking to different types of human behavior in a social setting. And um, now we are using this in this disease context setting, which is a very different approach, but it's still something, of course, of high relevance. Um, and, and this is really where different types of, of research community communities can join forces to decrease the necessary sample size to, to collect in these type of settings by pooling information using these trained layers, convolutional layers um, in, in leveraging deep learning and then going back to pinpoint where the signal coming from. So this closes basically the, the picture um, and, and shows again for me, if you put all these puzzle pieces together, um, you might be able with MLAI to actually differentiate healthy controls from what is called prodromal disease stages. So disease stages where patients are not already classified as having the disease, but they might show first indications of that. And maybe with the sensor data combined with MLAI, you can actually start to already differentiate here healthy controls from patients that soon develop a, a specific disease. That's the one point. Or in another setting where you develop them from that really sensitive measures that change over time and you can use them to really assess disease status and differentiate participants getting different types of therapies or drugs. And that brings us to one last example um, from a Parkinson's disease study, which is called Pasadena and from the year one um, readout. And you see here, what does it mean to deploy such a solution? So this was for 360. 16 patients, and we collected there uh, more than 30 terabytes of raw sensor data. They did roughly a million tests there in different types of ways. So not only hand turning, but also tapping on the screen, the tremor test, the speech test, and other tests. And then we turned all that data down using some methodologies I have shown here and beyond. 
and and all of that to actually make one decision and that is to see whether there are signs of drug efficacy and also in this context we develop from a feature space um, a kind of score using ML methods and um, to, to build a, a proxy of, of um, certain motor impairments in, in, <clears throat> in Parkinson's disease that were hypothesized to um, change fast over time in that specific early disease context. And what you can see here is um, on the left hand side, you can see clinical study results from um, um, MDSUPS part three bradykinesia. So that's really the clinician assessment of bradykinesia problems of the patient. And on the right hand side, you see results from our digital score. And you can see that um, in, in both instances, the clinician seeing certain things. In the, at the clinical visit and we measuring this high frequent in a high frequency type of setting where we as an aggregate data over two weeks intervals and then calculate the score out of that you see uh, um, a difference between participants getting the drug and not and you see that with our approach um, we reduce actually these these confidence spans and thereby get of course much more precise estimates of what is actually going on there and by measuring more we can also deploy different better statistical models in this case uh, a linear mixed model random slope model approach compared to MMRMs on the left which which um, cannot fully leverage this this type of continuous data in, in, in the way we can leverage it with, with more data being available um, and we can confirm thereby in an independent at home measured way what is seen in the clinic, which is of course important in a clinical study context. So as a recap, coming back to my vision. I mentioned we want to max, get maximal disease information out of that. And I hopefully could convince you that using MLI methods is a way to augment traditional signal processing in each of these steps to actually get to this maximal disease information output. And there was this open question of how do we actually get back from maximal disease information to sensor data? And as I already mentioned there, um, if you use deep learning, then you should unlock this black box and really understand where is it coming from and there is new developments there which are important and which you should leverage and you could approximate maximum disease information by really assume that a proper deep learning model might achieve nearly optimal performance <clears throat> and then you compare can compare it to what you have developed as traditional features a traditional classifier and see what is the gap and try to understand that as a summary I hope I could convince you that digital health technologies really offer great opportunities by creating a lot of continuous data. That there's the fact that traditional signal processing methods have their limits because they are invented by us and we don't know everything. And ML AI methods really are needed to augment the development of digital health technologies to maximize really the data value. And there are really there's many different ways on how to leverage ML AI in the course of this development. But, and that might be of interest for you, um, this is a very young and active field of research. And it comes with its own set of challenges. So first of all, one of usual problem is you have this low patient number compared to the complexity of the data. One solution could be intelligent ways of transfer learning. Then which is also quite unique, I would say, is you really have this high frequency repeated measures. And there are really limited solutions out there that um, can deal with these type of things in an optimal way, because you usually assume you have one measure of um, uh, a subject or of a probe or whatever. And then you collect this data in an unsupervised fashion so you are lacking often the ground truth which is an inherent problem in itself and lastly as i mentioned i really firmly believe that our results from the biomarkers need to be explainable in the disease context to subject matter experts 
regulatory agencies and very importantly to the patients. And that is something we really need to take care of and shouldn't keep out of our mind when developing complex ML AI solutions. That brings me to the end of the talk and means we have 15 minutes of questions left, which is great. Thank you very much for, for an exciting talk. I'm really glued to my screen here because it's, uh, it's very exciting to see that, that Roche uh, has these, uh, these topics on their, on their radar and is working to transform AI and, and healthcare. Maybe I want to start with a question that came in over Slido. It is on the role of uh, sequencing data. So let me just read this off for you, and then we'll we'll handle some other questions. I wondered I how you. <laughs> I see the question. Um, oh, you see the question. Okay, perfect, perfect. So um, I mean, the first question is um, how could sequencing data augment? Um, what we are doing in the digital biomarker, con biomarker context to um, even make better models by having certain um, predispositions at the very, be very beginning in the in the model, and um, and I think that that's a great question because it really brings into these different aspects of how you can look into disease. And I wouldn't even stop at at uh, sequencing data. There are also other. I mean, there's blood based measurements in general, there's um, MRIs and other things you can do at the clinical visit to um, try to stratify your patient population at the very beginning. And I think it really makes sense in the broader context to combine all this information into something that is, is really then tailored um, to, to really um, understand each patient in, in the best way possible. So, I mean, that's a yes, basically. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but it's really early days, I would say, <laughs> to, to do that. Um, and, and it's really disease depend, uh, dependent on, on where this, this, this can lead to additional gains in, in measuring something. Um, then the second question was, um, could digital biomarkers be a stepping stone to preventive medicine by detecting decreasing health long before diagnosis? And what are our plans? <laughs> and that's a very good question. So in the first place, um, um, I'm working in, in, in a part of Roche, which is all about um, drug development and clinical studies. So, so what I've shown you here as examples is really about um, um, measuring in the, in the first place, um, developing measures that, that can augment traditional methods to have better ways to see how disease is progressing, progressing and how drugs can impact that. But of course, there are many diseases where it makes a lot of sense to start really early on with these type of assessments. If you just take Parkinson's disease, then um, Parkinson's disease is, is, I mean, when you get your disease diagnosis, you have already developed a certain kind of symptoms. And that means a lot of things have already happened in the brain which are usually not reversible, um, meaning that they're still a late point in time to start with, with drug treatment. And it makes a lot of sense to try to move this type of um, yeah, um, treatments early on um, beyond the traditional point in time where, where you can um, identify the disease in the future. So that's, that's of course something which then needs to be shown. But in that sense, yes, it makes a lot of sense to, to um, look into that. It is of course difficult. And um, in general, that's something which, which is obviously, I mean, which is of interest for society and something which is not just done by one, one research institute or one pharma company, but that's something where which is really an active arm of development in the research community looking into these type of um, problems um, in the cognitive and in the motor domain. And there are a lot of different big and small players are, are trying their best to piece out more information. So if you Google for that, there are, I think, a lot of publications in the last years exactly around that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. 
I think we also have a question in the Zoom, if I see that correctly. So uh, Giovanni, can you unmute yourself and, and ask the question? Hi, thank you. So first of all, I found the topic really fascinating and incredibly challenging. I have a general question, probably. I can imagine that there's an incredible amount of challenges for these technology to be fully implemented. And one that I can imagine is convincing people to use it, like adoption. Um, I can see a lot of people that would benefit from it, for example, not being very adept with smartphones or maybe being concerned with privacy. Could you say a couple of words if you have any strategy or um, anything in mind to try to improve the adoption of these tools? Yep. No, that, that's, I mean, there are so many different things you need to consider there about adoption. <clears throat> um, I, I think first and foremost, it's really about two things. One is the data privacy component. Um, and and the, the other one is really this um, usability type of component because um, both of them might hinder you to, to convince participants to really do these things in, a, in the way you need it for a long amount of time. And, and in a clinical study context, um, you are in this lucky situation in that sense that um, via the research um, side, um, there's a direct contact to participants. So, um, so it is easier to encourage participants to, to really do their best to collect the data. Um, that, that's positive. Um, and with the drug studies, there's of course more incentive to get good data also for the patients themselves too, because I mean, they are volunteering for getting drugs, so they want to get the best information out of that. Um, and, um, but the other component is, is, um, is you want to use these type of solutions potentially also in, in the real world. You as someone who is not in a drug study, you might want to use that when you have a given disease for having a good conversation with your doctor um, to show them the data um, um, and, and, um, and show the, 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 the physician what he's not seeing at the clinical visit. And in these instances, of course, um, technology is, I mean, has been developed, is developing, and, and all of that is really on um, ensuring data privacy and, and um, um, following GDPR, really making sure that this data is secure. And that's, I think, what is what is really at the forefront of what needs to be kept in mind to um, really convince every one of us that, that we collect this data because it's data which is telling someone something about disease. Um, so it's really private information. And then you need to have this, the type, right type of connections to whoever you want to speak with. Um, so optimally, there are then developments where you have possibilities to send this data to your doctor in a meaningful way and, and, and not, um, or, or um, also see the data aggregated for yourself in an understandable way. So these are really difficult things for in a disease context, because I mean, you, not every one of us is someone who is studying at a university and then this um, may be also very worse in biology and so on, but you really have to, to, to develop something that is to a certain degree foolproof and, and um, also um, understandable for a wide variety of educational, but also um, different other backgrounds. And then it needs to be deployed on solutions that are widely available in a consistent way. So not everyone is using the newest high technology, high end smartphone, <laughs> but there are other um, less high end uh, solutions in there and, and all of them need to work. And um, then you also need to see what is the context of um, people in, in Europe might, might be different from people in the US and uh, from people in, in Asia or in Africa on how to deploy these solutions. So all of that is, is a challenge um, and there's development I'm going to look into that. Thank you. I think it's really interesting. Thank you. We have we have time for for other questions as well. I'm seeing that uh, Diane also has raised their hand in the chat. So please unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Thank you for the nice talk. Well, actually, my question was almost the same as uh, Giovanni. Uh, I was wondering if you have any feedbacks on how open patients are to this type of new technology. Uh, are they reluctant because they have to share a lot of data, or are they willing to participate? But you, yeah, kind of already answered. Yeah. 
No, it's, it's a really good question in, in general. And, and I, I mean, just to share a few insights, I already mentioned that, I mean, in the clinical study context, um, we are very, very positively um, seeing how this is adopted. Of course, I mean, one challenge there is um, that depending on the disease and the age group, not everyone might have a smart solution for that. Um, so what we do there is we deploy usually also smart watches and smartphones. So we give it to the participants in this case. And that also helps us to ensure a certain consistency of the data. But there's of course also a lot of um, bring your own device type of solutions out there. If you go into the smartphone world um, rather than using dedicated sensors like sleep maps or whatnot. And, and there are really a lot of studies kind of, um, over the last few years, which, which have deployed these type of things. One really important study is um, the Empower type of solution in the Parkinson's disease context um, and developed by Sage Bio Network. Um, they could really see that a lot of people in the US, in this case, um, has it controlled, but also Parkinson's disease people were willing to test that out and do that um, and collect a lot of data, tons of data. Also, I mean, in, in what we developed, I mentioned that this is Floodlight Open, which is also a downloadable solution in, in the microscopic context, where we also see um, or saw without a lot of advertisement, still quite a pickup to use that. Um, but as I also mentioned there, is, I mean, it's really important to care about data privacy, um, about anonymization of the data. You have to think about ways how to uh, make this the data then also available to the patients but also to research this around the world in a way that, that, that is fulfilling the different needs. And that's um, where a lot of development is still happening. Um, and, and, and where data anonymization is really playing a lot, a big role. I mean, I mentioned, for example, that we are also collecting audio data, speech data. That is something which under GDPR is really um, um, something which, which, it is, which is really um, private information. And so you need to really take special care to um, work with this type of data in, in an ethical way, um, following, I mean, being really compliant. And meaning if you go into these more open research type of scenarios, what you need there, and that's where MLAI can really play also an important role. You need to develop for example, in the future anonymization methodologies that on the one hand, make sure that all information about a given participant is, is filtered out. But on the other hand, you keep what is important in the disease context still in that data. And, and I firmly believe that where MLAI also will need to play a heavy role. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question, I think, in the Zoom chat by Emesha. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have a more, well, let's say, technical question in a sense. Um, so during this data collection process, you encounter, like, there are sensor issues or, you know, days where patients don't use their devices. Um, so there is a lot of missing data. And usually in papers, there isn't much explanation on, on how this is dealt with. And um, I would be curious uh, if, if there are certain um, yeah, approaches you usually take or, um, yeah. Yep, no, uh, again, a, a really relevant question. Of course, I mean, there, there's this, I mean, different ways of data loss, let's call it that way. One might be the technical problems. Um, another might be um, patient participants not being adherent enough. And I mean, first and foremost, you need to find out what is the problem. Um, so is it the data problem? I mean, it's a, is it the sensor problem or is it coming from the patient? Um, and so that's, that's inherently important because that also means that you um, have to do different things to see what this missing data can do to your final readout in terms of um, missing at random causes of, of missing data. So is it because the patient, is it because the device was not was malfunctioning or is it because maybe the patient was so bad 
that he couldn't do the test. So it's really important to find that out. Um, and so that's one, one part of the answer then methodology wise. Um, there are also several solu not solutions, but steps in that. First of all, what I mentioned, there's aggregation. So the daily information in itself um, is fluctuating because you have good and bad days. What we are interested in is in your general disease state. And a, a, a very important question for a given disease is how much data do you need to collect to estimate a good general disease stage? And, and that can mean just an example, like we did here in Parkinson's disease, where we aggregate data over a two weeks interval, where we don't need necessarily data from every day, but we need enough, da in, enough data. Otherwise, we cannot, I mean, otherwise, this type of aggregate is not stable enough. And then we would say, okay, for this two week period, there was not enough adherence for the given patient, therefore, the data is not there. But that means, of course, you can increase or you, you can um, thereby already solve a lot, uh, a lot of the missing data problem because you still collect enough data. Still, you might lose um, some data. And then, of course, it's the question of what type of statistical methodology do you use? Do you use imputation type of method? Do you use methods that inherently can deal with missing data in different types of settings so with these linear mixed models or also mixed model repeated measures? they inherently can deal with a certain amount of missing data without doing any imputations um, because you have this inherent assumption of different data points um, being connected, um, meaning that, um, and, and in a meaningful way connected. Um, and, and meaning you can use these assumptions to ensure that even if, if data is missing um, information, if transmitted over the course of time, basically. Yeah. So, but active field of research, very important actually. And, and um, yeah, it, it is, I think on the agenda of different research institutes, but also for example, there's something which is called DIME, which is a society around um, these type of digital health technology tools where um, developing novel statistical methodologies is also on their agenda of future research projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. If no one else has a question, I'm also happy to release every one of you into the break. I think this went this went splendid. Uh, thank you so much for for this exciting talk. It was really really a pleasure to listen and, a, and, a, and an excellent discussion. We will reconvene here at ten thirty with a talk by Sepp Hochreiter on modern Hopfield networks. So enjoy the break. And thank you again, Florian, for this exciting talk. I hope we can give you a round of virtual applause. Maybe this works. I'll also try clapping into the microphone. Let's see whether this does something. Thank you so much. And uh, see you soon in the after the break. Thank you.